on World News Tonight. Straining relations. India and Canada's diplomatic standoff continues as the two countries play tit for tat. Brewing dispute. The Philippines accuses China's Coast Guard of installing a floating barrier in disputed waters. NASA's first. NASA buzzes with excitement as a space capsule carrying its first asteroid sample returns to Earth. And dazzling Hangzhou. In a grander than ever ceremony, China opens the 19th Asian Games in Hangzhou. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We've got a number of coverages lined up for you tonight, starting off in neighbouring India. United States Ambassador to Canada David Cohen has said it is the shared intelligence among Five Eye partners that has prompted Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to go public with his explosive allegations against the Indian government that its agents were involved in the killing of Sikh leader Hardeep Singh Nijar. Amid an intensifying diplomatic standoff between India and Canada, the U.S. ambassador to Canada confirmed that shared intelligence had informed Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of the possible involvement of Indian government agents in the murder of a Canadian citizen. That's according to an interview to be aired on Sunday with U.S. Ambassador David Cohen, who said the intelligence came from the Five Eyes Network which includes the U.S., Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Cohen told, There was a lot of communication between Canada and the United States about this, and I think that's as far as I'm comfortable going. Tensions between India and Canada escalated after Trudeau said there were, quote, credible allegations linking Indian government agents to the murder of Sikh separatist leader Hardeep Singh Nijar in Vancouver, prompting an angry reaction from India, which denies the allegation. Nijar, who was shot dead outside a Sikh temple in June, had been campaigning for the creation of an independent Sikh homeland called Khalistan. India had designated him as a terrorist. The two countries have since announced tit-for-tat expulsions of senior diplomats as well as tit-for-tat travel advisories, and India has suspended new visas for Canadians. There was no way that India was just going to sit on its hands after these explosive allegations. Michael Kugelman is the director of the South Asia Institute at the Wilson Center. The best way to resolve it, the most ideal way, which is probably the least likely way to resolve it, is for India to agree to cooperate with Canada in Canada's investigation of this assassination. That has been Canada's core, consistent demand from day one. But, um, you know, India has, as I understand it, not been willing to do so, whether that's because it feels it has something to hide or it doesn't trust Canada or what, uh, we don't know. On Friday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken urged India to work with Canada on the investigation into possible involvement of Indian government agents in Nijar's murder. From our perspective, it is critical that the Canadian investigation proceed um, and it would be important that... Um, India work with the Canadians uh, on this investigation. Blinken is the most senior U.S. official to have commented on the diplomatic dispute. The U.S. and other traditional Canadian allies have so far taken a cautious approach to the matter, as political experts said this was partly because the U.S. and other major players see India as a counterweight to the growing influence of China. And now on to the impending U.S. government shutdown. With just a week before Washington runs out of money to keep the federal government fully operating, warring factions within the Republican Party and the U.S. Congress showed no signs of coming together to pass a stopgap funding bill. Funding the government is one of those basic responsibilities of Congress. And it's time for the Republicans to start doing the job America elected them to do. U.S. President Joe Biden slammed what he called extreme Republicans in Congress over the weekend saying the party's lawmakers needed to take immediate steps to prevent a government shutdown ahead of the September 30th deadline. At a congressional awards dinner on Saturday, Biden said Republicans needed to live up to the deal reached between his administration and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in May. We agree to spending levels of government will fund essential domestic and national security priorities while still, while still cutting the deficit by $1 trillion over the next decade. Now... 
small group of extreme Republicans don't want to live up to the deal. So now everyone in America could be forced to pay the price. Warring factions within the Republican Party in the House of Representatives on Sunday showed no signs of coming together to pass a stopgap funding bill. Congress so far has failed to finish any of the 12 regular spending bills to fund federal agency programs in the fiscal year starting on October 1st. McCarthy will push an ambitious plan this week to win approval for four large bills, including military and homeland security funding, that he hopes would demonstrate enough progress to far-right Republicans to win their support for a stopgap spending bill as well. But some of the far-right holdouts who want deep spending cuts that go beyond the deal passed in May showed no signs of relenting. They want around $120 billion in additional cuts just for the new fiscal year, which could hit programs ranging from education and environmental protection to Internal Revenue Service Enforcement and Medical Research. It's been a month since Japan began releasing wastewater from its destroyed Fukushima nuclear power plant, and its data shows that the levels of tritium are far lower than the international standard. However, China keeps in place its complete ban of all imports of Japanese seafood. This past Sunday marked exactly one month since Japan began releasing wastewater from its crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and concluded the first phase of the release on the 11th of this month. The first discharge amounted to a total of 7,800 tons and the Tokyo Electric Power Company diluted the contaminated water with a large amount of seawater before sending it through an undersea tunnel about one kilometer long. To analyze the impact of the discharge on the environment, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, along with Japan's Environment Ministry and other interested agencies, collected seawater and fish from around the nuclear power plant and analyzed each for tritium concentration. Data show that levels of tritium from the wastewater remain below the standards set by TEPCO. The highest concentration of tritium recorded was 10 becquerels per liter, detected near the discharge port on the 31st of last month. However, this was far below 700 becquerels per liter within three kilometers of the nuclear power plant, which TEPCO had set as the standard for discontinuing the discharge. Despite recent data showing the safety of the discharged wastewater, China is continuing to show its opposition. Since the release of the wastewater, China has imposed a complete ban on all Japanese seafood. The ban is a major blow to the Japanese seafood industry, as China is the world's largest importer of Japanese seafood. However, TEPCO will continue on with the release as it plans a second round and a total release of 31,200 tons of wastewater by March next year. This amount is equivalent to approximately 2.3 percent of the contaminated water stored at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The Philippines has accused China of blocking fishermen from a disputed area of the South China Sea by installing a floating barrier. The Philippines on Sunday accused China's Coast Guard of installing a floating barrier in a disputed area of the South China Sea. Footage released by the Philippine Coast Guard showed several Chinese vessels near the barrier, which Manila says is preventing Filipinos from entering and fishing in the area. A spokesperson said the Philippine Coast Guard and the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources strongly condemn the installation of the barrier in part of the Scarborough Shoal. China claims 90% of the South China Sea overlapping with the exclusive economic zones of Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia and the Philippines. Beijing seized the Scarborough Shoal in 2012, forcing Filipino fishermen to travel further for smaller catches. They were allowed to return as bilateral relations improved markedly under the Philippines' then-president Rodrigo Duterte. But tensions have mounted again since his successor, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., took office last year. The Philippine Coast Guard and Fisheries Bureau personnel discovered the floating barrier on a routine patrol on Friday. China's embassy in Manila did not immediately respond to a request for comment. An update on the Karabakh conflict now. About 120,000 ethnic Armenians from Nargano Karabakh could leave for Armenia because they do not want to live as part of Azerbaijan. The country's leadership also mentioned about ethnic Armenians, citing fears of ethnic cleansing. 
Armenia's Prime Minister Nicole Pashinyan said on Sunday the likelihood was rising that Nagorno-Karabakh's 120,000 ethnic Armenians would flee the region, fearing persecution. That's after an Azerbaijan military victory last week in a conflict that dates back to the fall of the Soviet Union. Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh continue to face the threat of ethnic cleansing. In recent days, humanitarian aid has arrived in Nagorno-Karabakh, but this does not change the situation. And unless real living conditions are created for the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh in their homes and effective mechanisms of protection from ethnic cleansing, then the likelihood that the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh will see exile from their homeland as the only way to preserve their lives and identity increases significantly. A mass exodus could change the delicate balance of power in the South Caucasus region, a patchwork of ethnicities crisscrossed with oil and gas pipelines where Russia, the United States, Turkey and Iran are jostling for influence. On Sunday, a reporter saw heavily laden cars with civilians approach an aid centre in the Armenian border village of Kornidzor. Last week, Azerbaijan scored a victory over ethnic Armenians who've controlled the Karabakh region since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. An advisor to the leader of the Karabakh Armenians told earlier on Sunday that the population would leave because they feel unsafe under Azerbaijani rule. Russia had acted as a guarantor for a peace deal that ended a 44-day war in Karabakh three years ago, and many Armenians blame Moscow for failing to protect the region. Indeed, Pashinyan blamed Russia publicly on Sunday for failing to do enough for Armenia which he said would review its alliance with Moscow. Russian officials say Pashinyan is to blame for his own mishandling of the crisis. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. on the road to the White House now. Bergam appears to have qualified for the second GOP debate, which is in California. He's the eighth candidate to meet those qualifications, joining former President Donald Trump, who is not expected to participate, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, business person Vivek Ramaswamy, former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, former Vice President Mike Pence, Senator Tim Scott, and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. To get on stage, candidates need to have 50,000 individual donors and hit 3% in a handful of polls that meet the Republican National committee's methodological requirements. The stage will likely be very similar to the first showdown in August. Trump, who is expected to be in Michigan next week, skipped that one as well. And the other seven candidates who qualified for the second debate all participated in the first. Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson is the only candidate not yet on stage for the second debate who was there for the first one. Bergam had an eventful lead up to the first debate. He injured his leg in a pickup basketball game just before the first showdown and his participation was in question. He ultimately took the stage and stood for the two hour debate. Now at the Mexico-US border, large groups of migrants are continuing to arrive seeking asylum. Amid the growing humanitarian crisis, United States Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas visited the border. Tonight, dramatic moments at the border showing the desperation and determination from people trying to get into the US. Border Patrol agents making a life-saving decision, cutting the razor wire fence to rescue this group of migrants carrying young children, then pulling them out of the dangerous barrier. The group got stuck after crossing the Rio Grande in Eagle Pass, Texas, where thousands have arrived this week. Others finding ways to avoid the razor wire. 400 miles away, the mayor of El Paso sounding the alarm. The city of El Paso only has so many resources and we have come to but we look at a breaking point right now. A new shelter opening its doors to help as the migrants continue arriving south of the border. In San Diego, the local rapid response network stretched to capacity, saying in a statement, we cannot provide respite shelter and services to all the people seeking asylum that DHS is releasing. Amid the crisis, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas visiting the border over the weekend. Most recently, Congress has yet to act 
on our requests for $4 billion in funding and resources. With cities like Eagle Pass bracing for a wave that continues to make its way through Mexico and headed to the border. Hundreds of people waving European Union flags rallied in central London, calling for Britain to rejoin the bloc. Protesters brandished placards reading, The road to rejoin the EU starts here, and rejoin, rejoice. Seven years after the United Kingdom voted for Brexit, protesters are still taking to the streets. Around a thousand people gathered in central London on Saturday, demanding that their country rejoins the European Union. Brexit has been an economic disaster for the UK and the loss of freedom of movement has impacted a lot of people. The loss of things like Erasmus. Um, I think we're better off together. A sea of EU flags culminated outside the British Parliament, where prominent anti-Brexit campaigners gave speeches, including former Belgian Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt. The UK will rejoin the EU. It's not a matter of if, but when. In June 2016, the UK voted by a small margin in favour of leaving the EU. After years of fraught negotiations, London formally left the bloc on the 31st of January 2020. Demonstrators here are not giving up hope. Their motivation, several polls over the past year that have found that around 60% of the population support rejoining the EU. You've heard the statistics, the number of people that want to rejoin, and it's young people that want to rejoin. A change in public mood that isn't reflected in UK politics for now. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak voted for Brexit and stands by his stance. While Labour Party leader Keir Starmer said he would seek a better Brexit deal, but not rejoin the EU. And now the latest on a historic space mission. NASA's first ever sample from an asteroid has touched down on Earth. The space capsule carrying the sample entered the atmosphere yesterday. It's an out of this world journey, seven years and four billion miles in the making. The FRC has entered the Earth's atmosphere. Tonight, NASA's first ever sample from an asteroid has touched down on Earth. Touchdown. The space capsule carrying the precious sample entering the atmosphere Sunday morning, traveling at more than 27,000 miles an hour, reaching temperatures of more than 5,000 degrees. At this point, we have entered in over San Francisco. Eventually landing in the Utah desert. Seeing it just sitting perfectly on the desert floor, hard to articulate what that means after so, so much uh, put into this mission. Inside the capsule, a half-pound sample of rocks and dust collected from an asteroid called Bennu, which scientists say could one day crash into Earth. It also may hold important clues to the origins of our solar system. We think of asteroids as pristine time capsules from the very, very early formation of our solar system. We hope to learn more about the building block material that made our own planet billions of years ago. Liftoff of OSIRIS-REx. The mission began in 2016, the spacecraft traveling years to reach the asteroid 200 million miles away from Earth. It was a challenging feat to do. The asteroid surface is kind of like a rubble pile, which we didn't expect. It's kind of like if you were to stand on a children's ball pit, you would fall right into that ball pit. Despite challenges, success. Finally, back on Earth, today scientists retrieving the charred capsule, anxiously waiting to unlock the secrets held inside. Welcome back. Now France is going to pull its troops from Niger. For more on this and more, let's take you around the world in a minute. French President Emmanuel Macron stated that France is set to end its military cooperation with Niger and pull its 1,500 troops out of the African country by the end of the year after a military coup there in July. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky stated that the U.S. had agreed to jointly produce weapons with Ukraine. He called this an absolute fantasy. Italian Mafia boss Matteo Messina Denaro, who was caught in January after spending 30 years on the run, has died. He was convicted of crimes that shocked Italy and sparked a crackdown on the Sicilian mob. Tropical storm Ophelia doused the U.S. Atlantic coast. Flooding and widespread power outages were caused through torrential downpours and unrelenting winds. Many armored vehicles stormed a village in the ethnic Serbian majority region of Kosovo. They battled police and barricaded themselves in the monastery in the resurgence of violence in the resting north.
And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We are leaving you tonight in China as the 19th Asian Games opened with a spellbinding ceremony. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.